welcome everybody to another episode of CNED's Development Dialogues, uh, where we take a deep dive into uh, looking at shared um, sustainability challenges facing the developing world uh, and what sort of partnerships and collaborations that we can uh, foster uh, to address some of these emerging challenges. Uh, I, today's focus is uh, on India's um, evolving interest and concern uh, about the Indo-Pacific region uh, and in particular the pertinent challenges of climate resilience uh, um, and, uh, and potentially forced migration and displacement of communities uh, living in the Pacific Island states. Uh, and, and we're interested in trying to understand what the issues are on the ground, but also what is the role that uh, India uh, and its partnerships in the region can play. Uh, and, and to just deconstruct this, uh, I have with me today, Dr. Jonathan Ritchie. Uh, he's a senior lecturer in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at the Deakin University in Australia. Uh, he's a historian, which is really exciting uh, for us uh, because uh, you know, he takes a particular look at uh, the kinds of changes that are happening in the region, which have a historical lens. Uh, and I think that's, that's really quite interesting. Uh, so, Dr. Jonathan, uh, uh, welcome and thank you so much for uh, for joining this conversation. Um, I'm going to go right ahead and kind of kick off this conversation. Uh, uh, and basically, I think I just sort of zoom out a little bit and want to talk a little bit about um, the small island states, uh, the island in the, India, in the, in the Pacific region. Uh, from the perspective of uh, global coalitions uh, related to climate change and development. Uh, so, Dr. Ritchie, what are your thoughts from a historical lens on the emergence and effect effectiveness of a cultural and political coalition of small island states and territories and the role that they can play in negotiating and shaping global climate governance? In particular, I'm interested in issues related to loss and damage uh, uh, which is permanent loss of territories to sea level rise, forced displacement, and those sorts of issues in the future uh, in relation to um, the kind of role of the global coalitions. Over to you, Dr. Ritchie. Thank you very much, um, Vikram, and thank you so much for the opportunity to take part in this dialogue. Um, it's uh, really exciting coming from my perspective and the perspective of, of my colleagues and friends and others down here in this part of the world. Uh, it's an interesting time uh, in so many ways, and may we not be cursed to live in interesting times. Um, the, um, we, we begin this discussion thinking about this concept of the Indo-Pacific, and, uh, and, and at the same time, it's a, it's a kind of a, we're able to blur those boundaries and think very quickly to think about the small island Pacific states um, as being in some way part of the Indo-Pacific. And I think that's a, possibly a really important point to begin on because uh, the concept of the Indo-Pacific, as you, I'm sure you know, is, is a, while of course there's a very long history um, of, a very, very long history, many millennia of uh, cultural and economic contact between, um, you know, what's now India and, and the nations and islands and territories of Southeast Asia and East Asia. Uh, in many ways that's kind of hasn't really included um, the Pacific, and it's interesting that uh, 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 the the concept of Indo-Pacific is something that's just really arisen relatively recently. Um, often, in more than anything, in a kind of like a defence or strategic uh, uh, framework, rather than in any kind of overall uh, natural or logical connectedness. Um, so it's an it's a, it's not necessarily the most comfortable fit, and I suppose therein right away. Uh, poses a problem for uh, the great powers that exist within our region, including India, of course, um, in terms of ha how one can um, react and interact with uh, the small island developing states in the Pacific, the SIGs in the Pacific in particular. So as COP26 showed us, um, uh, the Pacific island states, and more broadly, the leadership of the small island developing states around the world, are often regarded as the canary in the coal mine, uh, the the harbingers of of what might come next in terms of um, some of the, the worst effects of um, uh, 
man-made or human-made um, climate change. So uh, they're often seen in that way, and yet, uh, uh, despite that uh, perhaps overall deference that's given to the, um, the Pacific Island states, uh, they are so often really left out in the cold. Uh, and the, the important decisions that are being made or need to be made about um, climate change around the world still have to be made by the, you know, the major emitters and the major producers, uh, China and India and Australia, of course, amongst them. So uh, the Pacific Island states are really caught. Now, in terms of the history of their sense of, a, of some kind of um, you know, coalition or community that exists, that ever since you know, the ending of World War II, there has been uh, various forms of uh, uh, organisational connections across the Pacific. I mean, to be beginning with the, um, the South Pacific Forum, which was established by the, the major colonising powers in the Pacific, um, so the, the UK, the US, New Zealand, Australia, um, uh, the Netherlands for a short time. Um, and that was replaced as uh, the Pacific Island uh, colonial territories acquired independence during the 60s and 70s and into the 80s and then replaced by what became known as the Pacific Community. Um, and there is also the Pacific Islands Forum, which is another uh, organisational unit that brings together, um, actually within the forum, it actually brings together not just the Pacific Island nations, but also the, uh, the major uh, parties close by. So Australia and New Zealand, India is a dialogue partner uh, of the Pacific Islands Forum. But I just want to, bring my answer to an end, pretty wrap it up by, by saying that that's all at a kind of an organisational formal level. Um, and there is much stronger, and perhaps in the concepts of things like resilience, a much more uh, important way of seeing the Pacific Island nations. And that's to borrow a phrase from the, um, uh, the very well, uh, famous and well-known um, Tongan philosopher and writer, Epeli Haofa, that's this concept of our sea of islands where uh, instead of regarding the Pacific as this massive blue ocean uh, with island dots scattered across it, that's not a very Pacific concept. The, the Pacific people themselves would see the sea as being very much a part of their bailiwick. Um, so if, we, if, if it, it, for those of us particularly coming from landlocked areas like Australia or India, Sometimes it's very hard for us to understand. We, especially if you fly over the Pacific, you see lots and lots of blue, lots of clouds, every now and then a tiny little dot. But from a Pacific perspective, it's, it's the interconnecting spaces that are absolutely vital. And that creates a sense of a wider community that really does literally stretch across from, you know, the islands of the Western Pacific uh, all the way across almost to uh, uh, the coastline of North and South America. So there's a, there is a much more resilient and much stronger sense of this Pacific community, perhaps capital, lowercase c, community, um, than might be suggested by seeing how they might be regarded at major international events such as COP26. Um, okay, no, thank you so much for that. That's really interesting. Uh, and I think, uh, yeah, I think the fact that you, in some sense, Look at these issues from the perspective of Pacific Islands, and I can't claim to have a clear, good understanding of that. And I don't think many of our uh, listeners either. So I think that's a really uh, powerful analogy. Um, kind of moving on a little bit to uh, you know to to my second question here, which is um, you know obviously you know you have already referred to uh, the idea of the Indo-Pacific as being this kind of constructed idea. Uh, which has emerged over the past, uh, you know, few decades or, or, or perhaps even earlier. Uh, but, but really the kind of um, drivers that have brought this to the fore have often been issues around kind of conventional security and, and strategic concerns. Um, um, and, and, uh, and, you know, like for, for us uh, working um, at CNET, it's really interesting to see how these platforms can be used or is there any value uh, for them being, uh, you know, in, in some sense, trying to, if I may use the word, piggyback some of our concerns around climate and sustainability to some of the, these larger uh, uh, forums, 
around the Indo-Pacific, which are somewhat more focused on other sorts of issues, right? So what's the tension between the kind of uh, the, the regionalization, which is driven by uh, conventional sort of security and strategy versus our interest in looking at these regions from the lens of climate and development? Mm. Yes, thanks for that, Vikram. Very good question. Um, and I, I guess I alluded to this in my previous um, response about the, uh, which you also picked up on, on the, the kind of the more strategic and conventional security framework in which we think about the Indo-Pacific. I think, though, that um, there, is a, uh, there is a common thread here and there's an interesting uh, connection that might be worth and it's kind of intriguing to explore which comes back to the history. And in this way, I'm thinking particularly about the, the bond that uh, connects uh, many of us around the world, which is the history of shared um, colonialism. Um, I mentioned earlier that the Pacific Island nations had uh, all of them been uh, caught up in the great uh, you know, drive to uh, colonize the world that came particularly out of, out of Europe and also the United States and also um, parts of um, parts of um, Asia, and particularly Japan, during the Second World War. But uh, the strong connection here, I think, is to do with, um, and where I think there's really interesting opening here for India in particular, is the connection with Fiji. Now, why am I focusing on Fiji here? Well, Fiji was a British uh, colonial territory, uh, as the British did in many other parts of the world, including many other uh, what we now call small island developing states, in the Caribbean and uh, in the Indian Ocean, uh, were responsible for bringing large numbers of, um, of workers from the Indian subcontinent uh, in the 19th century to work in, in Fiji. And what the result of that now, of course, is there's a significant, a substantial um, uh, Indo-Fijian population, uh, members of the Fijian community who have uh, historical uh, and heritage connections with, um, with India. Now, that's been recognised uh, in, uh, throughout the time, but perhaps most recently with the uh, visit by your Prime Minister to Fiji, um, it is certainly the part of, um, of, of, our, of our region where India has perhaps the most um, influence, uh, and that's largely to do with the fact that there is that strong historical connection. And coming back to the point about things like climate change and so on, I think it may present an a, you know, a window, a way in to the Pacific that might not necessarily be seen to be the most obvious because I'm sure that people who might be listening to us, it may come as a surprise to see that there is a, a, an obvious way in for, um, for India as a major power in the Indo-Pacific to reach into the Pacific and play a significant role, um, uh, not just in the strategic relationship, which is dominated uh, in many ways by the um, contestation, I guess, between the United States and China, um, but, but also to um, uh, play a significant um, soft power role. Um, uh, and, and there are possibilities there for using the kind of technology that India is well known for uh, to um, establish and further uh, ideas of resilience uh, across the Pacific. I want to talk a little bit more about resilience later, but um, it, it comes back to my, cons my comments earlier, though, about the um, uh, how much power and influence the small island states do have in, 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 in affecting their own future or influ influencing their own future when so much of their existence is is marginal at best, tenuous at best, and that's largely caused by their um, their exposure to um, uh, the more uh, deleterious effects of, of climate change. So while there is very little that the small island states are able to do to um, uh, you know beyond perhaps acting as a moral conscience to make uh, the great major economic powers uh, adapt to adapt their, their positions in, a, in such a way to benefit small island states, where they have been working on is in uh, ways of uh, adapting themselves to the impact of, of climate change. 
And uh, that is kind of like, it's almost like the, uh, uh, you know, an action of despair, but it is nonetheless perhaps something that Pacific Island states need to do. And there is options there for, um, uh, you know, the major powers, and especially those who have a, a foot in the door, if you like, uh, to, uh, to have a role. I think that's, uh, yeah, thank you so much for that. I think that's really interesting perspective. Um, and and you, you have already touched upon the idea of resilience, um, in, you know, uh, and, and, and obviously we think of resilience kind of within the climate change community is in some sense a capacity or adaptive capacity to, uh, to natural disasters or extreme events or slow onset impacts. Uh, and, and, uh, and really, I think I think the most important question uh, from the perspective of climate in the small island states is this resilience of of the islands to the changes that are happening around them, and 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 how can that resilience be supported and facilitated both uh, politically and and in also in terms of capacities, whether technological or otherwise, uh, and uh, and obviously the the these islands have a long history of 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 dealing with um, upheavals or natural disasters. Uh, so yeah, some more thoughts on, on just like, how do we strengthen resilience um, uh, in the region through partnerships? Um, Thank you, yes. Uh, actually, the, um, <laughs> uh, uh, the most immediate response I can give you is to talk about the, uh, 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 the concept called the Pacific Resilience Partnership, when through that a thing called the Pacific Resilience Facility, which has been set up by the uh, Pacific Islands Forum, the community um, of the Pacific, with a view to uh, developing uh, a, uh, or it, it's not quite a sovereign wealth fund, but uh, the opportunity to say that we have a fund within the Pacific, which will uh, support, provide the kind of capacity that's needed in at the local level to uh, mitigate in as, as best as possible uh, some of the worst impacts of, of climate change. And, that, and not just climate change. I mean, obviously, what we've seen in Tonga uh, in the last two or so, so weeks has shown that not only is the Pacific subject to these kind of long-term uh, impacts of, of uh, climate change caused by whatever uh, uh, impetus, but also and always has had to have to deal with a range of uh, of uh, natural disasters. So the Pacific Resi Resilience Facility, which is only a relatively new concept and is being championed by uh, the members of the Pacific Islands Forum, um, the uh, Prime Minister of Tuvalu, for example, is a major supporter of it. Um, right away, there is an opportunity there for uh, the, the major powers to inject some much needed capital into this. And it changes the model, doesn't it? It changes the model of a development uh, initiative from a Kind of a development assistance or development aid uh, uh, focus to um, a much more uh, grassroots level uh, type of capacity building. So Pacific Resilience Facility. Taking a historical perspective, taking a deep historical perspective, um, I guess the answer to the long-term resilience uh, uh, challenge for the Pacific Islands has always been uh, to move on. The Pacific especially the low-lying Pacific Island nations, the coral atolls, of which there are many, um, have always been uh, marginal at best in terms of their ability to sustain life of any kind. Um, and uh, ever since um, humans began to populate the Pacific, which is over the last three or 4,000 years, um, uh, archaeologists will tell us that this is actually a, a, an established pattern and there will be islands where there clearly was some form of human occupation and thanks to prolonged periods of drought or a, a range of other climate issues, people have moved on. Now, I tell you that not because I'd say that's, oh, well, just let, let that happen. That's clearly not an ideal situation. And yet that is actually what is probably going to be the most um, logical or perhaps the most um, uh, immediate response. Uh, we've seen it already in a number of different ways. Uh, uh, the people of um, a, a, a group of islands off the uh, larger island of Bougainville in Papua New Guinea uh, called the Carteret, 
islands um, have had to, many of them have had to move to uh, the nearby island of Bougainville uh, on land that was purchased for them for this particular purpose by the Catholic Church. Uh, much more uh, uh, egregious example, perhaps, is the impact of um, phosphate mining by the British Phosphate Commission uh, on small islands such as Barnaba or otherwise known as Ocean Island, where the people had to be moved to an island in Fiji called Rambi, largely because uh, the uh, topsoil, the, the, the soil that would support any form of agriculture uh, was uh, totally removed thanks to this impact of this long-term phosphate mining, which was producing phosphate for fertiliser for growing crops largely in places like Australia. So that's been a pretty awful example and, the, uh, and perhaps a useful way of looking at what we do not want to have happen. Um, but there is no doubt that there is a real responsibility for the, um, uh, the major powers in the, in the region to find ways of facilitating that kind of um, emigration from, um, from the Pacific Island nations. And uh, that's beholden on us in Australia, it's beholden on our colleagues and friends in New Zealand. And I think it's also beholden on, on places like um, India and other powers in that region to make sure that that is always a, a fail safe option, a last ditch option. Uh, for, for, in, for so resilience is perhaps is, as I said this is the council of despair it's not necessarily resilience as we might see it but you could also argue that that's the way that people of the Pacific have, have adapted to climate change over the millennia that they have been living there so so I think what you're saying I think it's, I mean obviously very interesting uh, and maybe is also links to the global conversations on loss and damage but uh, migration and 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 moving on is a strong part of the coping uh, strategies of these communities. And therefore we need to have kind of the political frameworks to, to allow for that. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's, that's something uh, definitely uh, worth thinking much more about. Um, I think, I mean, my last question to you, I mean, especially for uh, the, our audience uh, uh, in India, you know, it's a little bit like a, a little bit of a sense of what's actually happening on the ground in, in some of the small islands. Uh, and, um, you know, how are, you know, are we beginning to see uh, impacts of climate change? Uh, are, you know, what, what's kind of happening at the level of the communities uh, and, and, and settlements? Uh, and since you are a frequent uh, visitor to these places, you know, if you would give us some kind of a sense of, of what's, what does the what does it look like uh, in in the Pacific Islands at the moment in relation to kind of climate impacts, climatic changes, and how communities are coping with it at their own level? Yes, thank you. Yes, it's um uh, it it is quite remarkable uh, to see if to understand something about the spread of humanity when when one goes to a uh, it, it, it's hard to think of anything that what would be more remote than uh, a coral atoll in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, um, uh, and yet it, that's been colonised and been reached by human human um, settlers over the thousands of years. Um, the only way that people have been able to make some of these small island um, uh, small islands hab habitable um, is by uh, clever use of probably what is the most important resource of all, which is freshwater. Um, and in part, that's come out come about because of a of a naturally occurring wonder, which is that fresh water uh, uh, weighs less than salt water, is more buoyant than salt water, and so the small island states, the small, small island atolls, and so on, will have uh, the sea level below them, the, the water table, and floating on top of that, uh, in uh, you know, under under the land, is a lens of fresh water. And so what people historically and traditionally would do would be they would dig holes and into the, to tap into that freshwater lens and in those holes they would plant uh, crops, um, taro, uh, a range of other kinds of crops, bananas and so on. Now, of course, as sea level rises, what happens to the freshwater lens is that the freshwater dissipates um, and that's, of course, exacerbated by some of the other impacts of climate change uh, to do with things like the increase of um, 
storms, cyclones, hurricanes, uh, also drought. And it means that islands that might once have been, uh, you know, marginal but still able to be uh, uh, settled and lived in in a meaningful way become much, much, much more tenuous. And uh, that's what we're seeing happen. Uh, so it's not just about, you know, some of the terrible pictures one might see of uh, the ocean actually physically rising and lapping, on, you know, against the houses and so on. That's certainly a problem. But it's a more uh, invisible, uh, but in many ways a more uh, um, punishing, a more crucial, uh, yeah, a, a more deleterious out outcome, which is that removal of access to that crucial resource of, of fresh water. So what happens then? People will move, and they'll move either in a forced way or you know, a mandatory way, or they will do so deliberate. Uh, do, do so on their own. They'll individually wish uh, to do that. And where do they go to? They go to the places in the Pacific where uh, they can uh, carve out a life. And that will be the uh, larger islands, the larger towns in places like Fiji, Solomon Islands, Samoa, uh, Papua New Guinea is a very good example. And so you get the growth of a large, uh, relatively large uh, urban population. Um, and that brings with it a whole range of other cultural and economic problems. So it's, uh, it's, it, it's not a great situation. It really isn't. Uh, in, in terms of ad adaptability and uh, the opportunity the ability of people within the islands to um, uh, to adapt and to manage as best they can uh, the impacts of uh, in the various ways in which uh, climate change impacts. It's not just about sea level rise, but it's about the whole range of different weather in, in, uh, effects. Um, there is a long history of trying to do this, of trying, but but it's. I think there is a case of this is what's been accepted is that. Um, it's a, um, uh, a self-reinforcing loop um, and becoming worse and worse and worse. So um, on the ground, or perhaps I should say on the water, um, people are doing it tough. Uh, there are, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, small local level initiatives that are paying off uh, that are, you know, for example, uh, 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 efforts to uh, establish uh, mangrove um, plantings along the coast as a way to uh, reduce the impact of, um, you know, ocean waves and so on. Um, those sorts of things are happening, um, but uh, it's perhaps uh, on their own, not enough. And that comes back to what I hope is my main point, which is there is great responsibility on the part of uh, the major players in our overall Indo-Pacific region uh, to do something more than we're doing. And I'm hopeful that that will happen. Great. Uh, thank you so much for that. I think that's, that's about all the time we have. And it's been a really uh, rich conversation. Certainly, I've learned a lot. And yeah, we hope to continue to uh, think through some of these issues with you uh, in the future. Thank you, Dr. Ritchie. Thank you very much, Vikram. It's been